Every day we see series of conflicts worldwide and, and many of these conflicts we find that Islam is there or it is an Islamic country or is, uh, something about Islam. In Iraq we have the Sunnis and the Shiites who are constantly uh, you know, uh, uh, opposing to one another. In India and Pakistan they always fight over the borders. They both have nuclear uh, weapons. And Israel in 2006 since forever has always had war, but in 2006 with Hezbollah, it is supported by Iran and Syria. Uh, Iran that threatens to destroy Israel and they have a nuclear, they are looking to build nuclear arsenal. On top of all of these uh, national conflicts, we have the Islamizations of the West. We have the threat of Islamic terrorists in Muslim countries and in Western uh, countries as well. So what role does Islam play in the world? And how do we find the Islam in biblical prophecy and in eschatology? What is the final outcome of Islam? And how should we react to, to Islam? And many, many questions like that come to mind when we look at everything, all the conflicts between Islam and the West. Uh, to know where the world is going, it is important to know uh, where we are at the moment and look at the uh, scriptures. Thursday night, uh, two weeks ago, I took part in a talk here in Lighthouse with uh, Christian Solidarity uh, about ISIS. And we had a scholar, a young man, a Chinese uh, researcher and uh, professor at the Hong Kong Institute of Education who lived in Yemen for seven years, has learned Arabic, his wife also lived over there, and, and has done research on Islam, has studied all of his degrees are on Islamic studies and everything, and we, it was very enlightening. And since that time, it gave me also a desire to read more and to get more information about this, because it's, it's important. It's all around us, you know. At the end of his talk, he was telling us how Hong Kong should be alert on that reality. They are in all of our universities now. They have halal food in the kitchen of the universities. Uh, they are praying in the prayer rooms in our universities. The Christians are not praying, but the Muslims are praying. Uh, we have 300,000 Muslim in Hong Kong. Many of the Hong Kong families are opening their homes to Muslims, Indonesians, and these children are going to be trained by women wearing their veil and doing their prayers to Allah without knowing. They think they are saving money because it's cheaper to have an uh, Indonesian helper than the Filipinos but I would choose 10 times to pay the money for a Filipino helper and get my children to have a, amen? amen. Hallelujah, amen. praise God. So you vote for me in the next election, okay? <laughs> Hallelujah, amen. So we, we, we see these things and it is, it is, it is around us. We, we meet them on the street here in Hong Kong. They are everywhere in our streets. They are in America, they are in Europe, they are everything. And they are answering the call. They are in the media and ISIS is tweeting them to go in every country and attack the Pope, to attack Rome and to you know, do, do, do disturb everything that is uh, happening in this world. So there's something that we need to know about it about this threat, about how are we going to respond to that? Are we going to sleep and do like nothing is happening? Or are we going to realize that something uh, ch world changing is happening and our generation, we are part of it, and our children are going to, to, to taste of that change much, much more than, than we are to concerning the effects of the policies that it will bring, the changes, political changes everywhere. So our ignorance of the Islamic State is understandable because before August, July, August of last year, nobody saw them as a threat. <laughs> President Obama, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> has declared that they were not a threat, that they were not really Islamic, that they were not like really true Islamic, which is really wrong, but anyway. Many view the Islamic State as a bunch of psychopaths. In a way, they are because of the actions that we see do, but they are not in the real sense because they are very knowledgeable 
Everything they do, they do with uh, knowledge. They do with beliefs. They are very, very uh, religious and they follow a prophetic methodology and they consider themselves a key agent, agent in the coming apocalypse. So there, you will hear some terms this morning, you will be surprised a little bit. And that's why I'm, I'm challenging you this morning to get more information and to equip yourself and to prepare yourself to be an evangelist, a Christian, a light that shines in this world, in this generation, not with fear but prepare to be the man and the woman of God that God wants us to be, to be the church, his church, his followers, the, and, and do everything and, and according to the potential that we have. We have the Holy Spirit with us. We have the word of truth with us. We know the events that are coming. That's why I call this one, why are the nations in an uproar? And we need a biblical perspective of the future in lights of the events. So in order to understand more about a bit what the reality that we have, I have found a video this week that I have edited and I want you to listen very carefully to what it will say. It is a Muslim woman who has studied uh, the ISIS very carefully. Uh, she calls herself a moderate Muslim, so she is not in support of them, but she, has, she is telling a message that we need to know about it. <coughs> and a lot of insight about why are they doing what they do. But some of, of, of the Bible interpreters think that Pope Francis is the king of the north. And uh, he, is, he has called the nations to unite and take a war against, like he has called actually a holy war. And this has not happened since the Ottoman Empire in the 1600s when they were invading uh, uh, Europe. So since that time until now, there is no such a thing as a holy war. But so why has the Pope called the nations to unite, the Western nations, or the Christian nations to unite against the threat of uh, uh, ISIS and all this? This is a very turning point and that this is very important that we may uh, learn something about that. And the uh, ambassadors of the Vatican has says that the reason why the Vatican is calling for military actions against ISIS and says because our age <coughs> is an extraordinary one. So it has really implication in our world. So who is ISIS? In short, it is a Sunni, Salafi, Jihadist group. And in order to understand them, we need to understand a few important things. Uh, know the religious, apocalyptic, goal of ISIS, and we will learn some of it in the, this video. Joining us now for more analysis on the ISIS threat and their spiritual ambitions is Asad Nomani, author of Standing Alone, An American Woman's Struggle for the Soul of Islam. Uh, let me ask you this. You have spent hours studying ISIS videos and their writings. What have you discovered about the group's spiritual ambitions? Well, I studied these for hours because I wanted to understand exactly what motivated them. And what I learned is that the Islamic State is very much Islamic because it uh, validates its theology based on the Quran, the Hadith, the sayings or traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, the fatwas of scholars through the ages, and finally this last thing called eschatology or the science of end times according to Islamic belief. And to really understand the Islamic State, you have to look at the motivation and the theology and the ideology that drives them. What you see in the eschatology that these people believe in is basically their war plan. In this case, with the Islamic State, they're very much trying to create a war that will lead to domination as they see it. And we have to really try to understand that if we really want to try to fight them effectively. On the subject of uh, Islamic es eschatology, there's a moment in the ISIS video uh, released last month showing the beheading of the 21 Egyptian Christians. There's a moment where the main executioner makes reference to Jesus Christ and the return of the Islamic Mahdi, the Islamic Savior. Can you tell us more about this? Absolutely. You know, for years now, I've been studying Christian and Islamic es eschatology. What I noticed very quickly was that there are real parallels, except, of course, for the end. And the end, as the Islamic State and many people who believe in Islamic eschatology embrace, 
is this idea that the uh, armies will come down from Khorasan, which is in eastern Iran and northern Afghanistan, where, waving these black banners. And that's why we see these black banners always in the iconography of folks like the Islamic State. And they will come through Syria, and then they will arrive in Damascus. And Jesus, whose name is Isa then in Arabic, will stand at a minaret at the Grand Mosque of Damascus. And there he will meet the Mahdi, the Messiah of Islamic eschatology. The Mahdi will ask Jesus, please lead the prayer. And in this very important moment in the prophecy, according to those who believe in it in Islam, Jesus will say, no, you lead the prayer. And so what's that code for? That he defers to the leadership of the Mahdi. And so in that way, at that significant moment, we have this important departure from the eschatology of other faiths. Asra, your most recent article for The Daily Beast is entitled ISIS, Christians Worse Than Murderers. Why is ISIS specifically targeting uh, Christians? You make the argument in your article that it is based on the Quran. It is based on the, the Holy Scriptures as according to their interpretation, right? I grew up in a family that completely believes in the peaceful coexistence of all people. But sadly, if the Islamic State takes text from the Quran, I have one um, Quran right in front of me here, and there's this chapter and verse that comes from the um, a chapter called Al-Tawbah, which is sometimes called the war verse. And in chapter 9, verse 5 then, it says, when the sacred months have passed, so the mushrikun, wherever you find them, and capture them and besiege them. So the mushrikun is a word for people who are pagan, polytheists, or non-believers. Now, most Christians would say, hey, we're not pagan. But the, in this interpretation that the Islamic State puts forward, the belief in the Trinity amounts to polytheism. And so I know that may be offensive to a lot of Christian listeners, and, uh, but nonetheless, the issue that emerges then is that anybody who strays from their idea of, quote, Sahib, or the oneness of God, is a mushrikun and then liable for a target on their back. And that's included me, because I don't accept their interpretation of Islam, and so I also have been called a mushrikun. The word that they are borrowing from is this word, word called shirk, and shirk means the belief of any uh, entity equal to God. And that is then what we are all guilty of when we don't believe in their version of Islam. So, And that's what you're seeing today play out uh, across Syria, across Iraq, and not just uh, Christians, but Muslims who don't uh, subscribe to this um, a worldview, this end times worldview uh, of the Islamic State, right? Yes. And what I also want to do is clearly identify that this is a theology that exists within Islam, and it has been exported from the government of Saudi Arabia into the world. As a result, the Saudis have targeted Shia Muslims or any a minority sect within Islam. They have targeted uh, Muslims like myself who don't agree with their interpretation of Islam, and thus we don't have churches in Saudi Arabia because to them, this is shirk. This is the manifestation of, of paganism or polytheism that they refuse to accept. In a recruitment video I mentioned in the Daily Beast article, the uh, one of the jihadis says, we are here to avoid fitna, which is mean, it's an Arabic word meaning conflict. And to them, shirk is the worst fitna. But I argue that they are creating more fitna in the world through their interpretation of Islam and that they must be stopped both theologically and operationally. Terrific, incredible insight. And I hope we can call on you in the future because this is a subject that is not going to go away anytime soon. But this gives us an insight of who are these people, why do they build, are so extremes. They are practicing pure Islam. 
this is how Islam started and they are bringing it in the same way and the same practice the war verse and everything they are practicing that they are they believe in crucifixions they believe in uh, doing all of these things if you look to the next slide uh, Andreas you will have a, just a, a few quotes that I took from some of the uh, uh, Islamic State ideology uh, Bernard Eccles the foremost secular authority of the Islamic State ideology ISIS is trying to recreate the earliest days of Islam and is faithfully reproducing its norms of war. There is an assiduous, obsessive seriousness about the group dedication to the text of the Quran. So these fighters are not ignorant. They read the Quran, they meditate the Quran, they pronounce the Quran all day long. So whatever they do, there's no arguments possible with these people. There's no desire for a peace talk and everything because they are completely convinced uh, of that. Uh, Anjem Chudari, London, most notorious defender of the Islamic State. It's funny that he is in London. Crucifixion and beheading are sacred requirements. So you, you wonder, like, wh why are we going in that? Musa Sir Antonio is an Australian, reported to be one of the Islamic State's most influential recruiters. It is foretold, this is like a prophecy of their ap apocalyptic view, it is foretold that the caliphate, their leader, Baghavi is like, he has called himself the uh, Ibrahim, the Caliphate Ibrahim now, as a descendant of Ishmael and all this, will, they will sack Istanbul before it is beaten back by an army led by the anti-Messiah. So they have an anti-Messiah, they have anti-Christ, they have uh, something in their eschatology that is similar to our eschatology, but at some point, like she says in the video, they are uh, departing. Their view and our view is completely uh, different. But in their view, uh, they will themselves be beaten. But by their actions, they will usher the apocalypse. The apocalypse will, will come uh, because of what they are doing. The former Secretary of Defense, Chuck Eagle, says, truly we are living in historic defining times. And this is, this is true that we are in those, in those times. Praise God. So I want to turn to scriptures now and look what we can learn about coming events from the Bible. And I want to start with Daniel chapter 11, verse 42 to 45, because this text, we can... Many Bible scholars think that it is applying to ISIS or, or the events of this world uh, right now. So let's, let's read uh, this one. Then he will stretch out his hand against other countries, and the land of Egypt will not escape. But he will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And Libyans and Ethiopians will follow at his heels. But rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and he will go forth with great wrath to destroy and uh, annihilate many. He will pitch the tents of his royal pavilion between the seas and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. So we read in this text, rumors from the east and from the north will disturb him, and yet he will come to his end, and no one will help him. Isn't it interesting? Whoever the king of Daniel 11 is, he will be defeated. And this is the, what we want to see, because we look at the headlines, we see the videos, we see the, the military preparations, and all the, the media pictures that are throwing to us to create confusion and fears and trying to recruit more followers. They have uh, access to money, petrol, they have access to a lot of things to, to, to strengthen their arsenal and everything. But it says here, he will come to his end and no one will help him. You know, the ISIS, they are Sunnite uh, believers, the core, the purest of Islams. But f in order to f continue on their mission, they must kill all the Shiites, Christians. In Iraq, you have 200 thousands in, in the Middle East, just next to them, more than 200 million of them. So they must kill them all, because th to them, the Shiites have added things to Islam. 
and it is not acceptable. They have taken away the purity of, of, of the Quran and the teaching of Muhammad, so they must die. You see, with Christians, sometimes they will, we, we have seen that they have killed many, but for many of them, according to the teaching of uh, Islam, it is you turn them, you make them pay a tax. And they must, the Christians and the Jews, must acknowledge the, the sovereignty of Islam over them, not necessarily to, to convert, but just to accept them to rule over them and to pay the tax, and they will be spared life. In most cases, it will be like that. If you can pay a tax, most likely it will, it will have. Certain groups of Muslims, they will kill the men, they will take their wives and children, and their wives will become concubines. It is an Islam. This is how Mohammed started his military campaign. You know, Muslim, the Islam, the, the very root of, of Islam, when they started to fight and expand, it was not religious at first. It was war for, for taking possessions, gold and silver and the conquest. So it did not start at first as a religious movement or it was not led by some type of divine revelation. It, was, it became that later, but it did not start right with the right motive. It started with greed and with uh, war and, uh, and conquest and desire of, of power. So the king of Daniel 1136 will be defeated. Who is the north? We have uh, uh, Russia in the north, we have other countries in the north, and we have coalitions of countries also. And they are both the nations of Ezekiel 38, and we will come to, to that in a moment. So Islam is a religious kingdom, as a religious kingdom, as wage war against Jews and Christians in the name of Allah for a long time. And Islam has waged a holy war against the Jews, the Christians, and others since its foundation. And now it has been revived in the Islamic state. And it says, no one will help him. And what does God will reveal about ISIS and the prophetic timeline? Most Bible scholars recognize that ISIS is going to die. As it comes, it will go. Like many movement or many enemies of Israel. To understand Bible eschatology, and we will talk about it in a moment, and to understand the, the study of the end times, you need to understand Israel and then his unique relationship with God based on the alliance that God has made, the covenant that God has made with, with uh, Abraham. All the nations will be blessed. Those who bless you will be blessed, and those who curse you will be cursed. And then every attack in the uh, uh, past history or in the modern history, do you remember the, the war, six days war, just in the 60s? All the nations, the Arabic nations, just came as a coalition, and it, there was not a chance. There was not a chance that Israel would have survived this. And within six days, Israel con conquered the whole territory of Egypt and uh, the West Bank. The every, every place they, they are reconquered all the line and in six six days. And they have says that every weapon have been guided by God. God was on their side. It was a truly uh, a miracle. So this is a story, a history lesson that we need to, to know. And if we want to interpret properly the future events, you need to remember this covenant that God has made with Abraham. Amen. So most Bible interpreters says Isis might not survive. But then even if they do not survive, uh, later there will be a far more even powerful enemy that will continue to attack because Jesus says wars and rumors of wars nations will unite with nations kingdoms and kingdoms and there will be coalitions of many many uh, times like, like this and there will be more and many people see that the next uh, enemy that will come after ISIS will be Iran and Iran as uh, now is foot in the politics and the governing of Syria. Iran is in Yemen and the, the military coup that just took place. Iran is also controlling Lebanon, Syria, Yemen and also is a very strong ally with Russia 
and he has also his hand in the war to Iraq. Actually, the United States are counting on the power full military uh, weaponry of Iran to counterattack uh, the, 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 the strength of ISIS. So Iran is probably going to be the next strong military force that will threaten the world. And they are looking for these uh, nuclear weapons. So the next events in the calendar will be quite uh, more dangerous than what we are facing at this very moment. So to understand that, let's look at the, at the map of uh, Ezekiel uh, 38, uh, Andreas. And then you see, I will read the text here, Ezekiel 38, 1 and 2, and then look at this map here. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog and the land of Magog, the, the chief prince of Meshesh, Tubal, and prophesy against him. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his orders, Beth to Garma from the uttermost part of the north with all his hordes. Many people are with you. So this is what we, we read in Ezekiel 37, uh, 38. But in Ezekiel 36 and 37, Ezekiel, that's more than 2,000 years ago, had prophesied about the restoration, the coming back of Israel as a nation, which was impossible because they had been like dispersed among the nations. But if you have read books, I, I read historical books on the coming back, on the birth of the, the nation of Israel, it's as uh, amazing. And the, the horrors and the, the, the wars and the killings and the blood that was shed in this period of time. But the miracle took place and, and Israel is coming back from all nations of the world. So right after that in Ezekiel 38 and 39, then we have the descriptions of the, the one of the next battle to, to take place. So between ISIS and this battle here, we will have series of world events because this is happening probably in the middle of the tribulation. This is how we interpret the battle. We are not going to be here ourselves. Those who believe in the raptured, and we will be raptured, we will be raptured just before these events. But these events are going to come. But between ISIS and these coalitions of uh, uh, political co coalitions and military coalitions that will attack Israel, many events need to take place. And you know how rapid the successions of events can, can happen now and, and all of this. So you see Russia on this map, you see the modern uh, countries, and on this map you see the old names, and you recognize it on this, on this side. So it is what will happen. And then you see little Israel, this little red dot, right there. So all of these powerful nations are coming against uh, uh, Israel on that place. So what about you this morning in this room? Do you have a sound perspective of the future events? ISIS have an eschatology of the last days. Islam has a, 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 their own interpretation of the future event. They have an apocalypse. We have an apocalypse. They have an apocalypse. Israel has an apocalypse. And these are three different eschatologies. So where do you stand? So what do you know? If you would meet this morning with Muslims who are quite skillful, do you know that Muslims, children in Hong Kong, after school, they go to these training centers and they are trained in learning, meditating, repeating, memorizing the Quran. And our children are not doing that. Eh? But the Muslim children, they are doing that. So they are being like really, uh, you know, brainwashed into, into the, these kind of things. You know. But you, if you would meet like uh, Indonesian ladies at the market, are you equipped to debate about the deity of Jesus Christ? Because they don't believe that Jesus died. Really? He didn't really die? You have heard in the video that uh, Jesus Christ will defer to the Mahdi. The Mahdi that is their, their Messiah of their times. So Jesus Christ will yield to his leadership. That is what they believe. The, and they, they call you polytheists because we, you, you believe in the Trinity. Do you have answers for that? What is your approach to Muslim? They are all around us. 
Now we don't have to go to the Middle East to, to be with the, the Muslim. They are everywhere. And we are the Christian church. We have received a mandate to preach the good news and we have the Holy Spirit. Many, we, we know that many Islamic people are getting converted today. Many of them are in horrible, horrible situations. The, all the Shiites, Christians, I mean Muslims, they, their life is in danger more than, than many Christians is. So maybe it's a good way for us. It's a good time to approach them and to reason with them and to tell them how much Jesus uh, can help them in their life. There, is, there are open doors uh, over there. There are ways. Muslims are open to the divine. They are open to the supernatural. When, they, they, when you pray, Muslims don't pray like you. I was told by many Muslims who got converted, don't argue like only argue, argue. Pray with them love them they are touched by love and they are touched by prayer because when you pray you pray to the heavenly father you have a relationship with the savior you pray mercy you pray compassion you pray love you pray a relationship they don't have that they don't have that these kind of things so what you have you can offer to them we don't have to uh, I, I know some Muslims they have been converted while studying away from home. When they are away from home, they are not like uh, super, super controlled by family and society. They are uh, opening to the rest of the world, many of them. So if they are here in Hong Kong, there's a chance that maybe their mind is a little bit more open. If their mind would not be open, they would not come to Hong Kong. They would not go out of their country. So the fact that they are out of the country is that there's already an indication that their mind is a little bit more open. So love can touch hearts and transform. And the word of truth, you know the word, the word is, the, is living word when you put the, the seed in. They have been told lies against Christianity, things that are not true. So they need to, to know, they need to hear the truth. Who will tell them the truth? It is you and me, because God puts us in a unique situation at this time. Do you have a, a perspective of the future uh, things? Eschatology is the study of the final things, the study of the last things, the events leading up to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the end of the human history as we know it at the moment. There are two uh, a dual purpose for eschatology. Eschatology is meant, the study of the end time is meant to do two things to us. The first thing, it is designed to deepen our confidence and God as the sovereign, your God, God our Father. Jesus is, when, when the disciple asked Jesus, teach us how to pray, how did he start? Our Father, which art in heaven, uh, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. So already it starts with the picture of authority, the creator, the sovereign. This is your God. This is your God. So to study this catology and to discover that at the end, God wins. God, of course, wins. What do you think? God wins. So if you are on his side, you are on the winning side. So it deepens a confidence, eschatology, the study of the end times, to know what is going to happen, all these wars, and all the things that, that Daniel has prophesied, Ezekiel has prophesied, and all the prophets, and then you read in Revelation, it is to build your confidence in the sovereign Lord over history. God will bring his plans to completion. Amen? Hallelujah, do you believe that? Righteousness will prevail. You can look at the events now. There's so much corruption and justice and violence in this world. Righteousness will prevail. Not in our calendar. Not maybe at the time that we wish for. Evil will be defeated and Jesus Christ will reign. And those who follow with him will reign with him. That is you and me. So eschatology is important because it tells us that God wins. And because he wins, he must be worshipped. It is, you know, the, 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 the only response is to worship him, 
to accept Him, to walk with Him, to serve Him, to love Him, and to trust in Him, and to be confident because He is God. Amen? He is God alone from before time began. Amen? We sang that today. But eschatology has also a secondary purpose. It is to encourage and sustain us into practical righteousness. It's not easy to live. And, and there is so much immorality and unrighteousness in this world and to be led astray and to fall and to compromise and to go in sin and to darkness and to cheat and lie and uh, be filled with the things of this world. So eschatology is also meant to remind us and to encourage us and give us strength and motivate us to sustain the fight that we are in, to sustain the quality of life, to live truthfully, to live wholeheartedly and for Jesus Christ. Because many times we know in Christianity, we look at history, and, and, and Muslims can uh, feed themselves a lot on that, that many Christian history has not always been very good. Uh -huh. or what has been done in the name of Christianity or how Christian has lived or Christian lives uh, is not always a good testimony but there are true Christians in this world amen the true followers of Jesus Christ and you are supposed to be one of them amen so the, the eschatology to, to study the end times to read Revelation actually in Revelation it starts with happy are you or blessed are those who learn and memorize and uh, um, how you can say that uh, recite the, the prophecies of this book. They are uh, a series of blessings for those who, who feed themselves and nourish yourself and, and to that. So that the, one of the purpose of the eschatology it is to encourage and sustain us to live wholeheartedly for God. Amen. So this morning I pray that you will be strengthened by that. The Lord said, I will let the nations see my glory and show them how I use my power to carry out my just decisions. The Israelites will know from then on that I am the Lord their God. So this is as chapter 39. And the war of Gog and Magog is going. And then you find the purpose where God says, I will let the nations see my glory and I will show them how to use my power to carry Israel's will know so God has a purpose and when you study the end times you discover the purpose of God you see that God has a plan you see that God is actively involved that God is very much aware and conscious and he knows and he does things very precisely and he has a very clear purpose let's go to Psalm 110 very quickly there are a few series of psalm that uh, we 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 call them um, royal psalms because they talk about god as as a king as as the king and they refer many times to david but they also refer to the messiah and then uh, psalm 110 when you start says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. The Lord will extend your powerful kingdom from Jerusalem. You will rule over your enemies. Many people in this world, they think of Jesus in many ways, teachers, a special man, a good moralist. But here it describes us in this psalm that he is king that he rules the world that he will rule this is a prophetic psalms that points to further events and, and all of this and uh, he is to sit at the right hand and the place of the highest authority he crushes kings he executes judgment and he has sure victories when jesus christ rose from the dead and went back to heaven god put him back into his original position in his right hand. And the resurrection of Jesus for you and I is so significant because it is the proof of who he is, that he is God. At the beginning was the Word. Before the world came to existence, the Word existed. The Word was God. Everything that has been created has been created by the Word. And the Revelation chapter 5, if you go to the next uh, slide, the Revelation chapter 5, um, 
John is desperate because no one is worthy to break the seals on this scroll and open it. This is a very, very important text. If you ever have a discussions with Muslim, you must show them this text. Uh, who is worthy to break the seals and to open the scroll and to open it? But no one in heaven, no one on earth, uh, under the earth was op able to open the scroll and read it. And then he cried desperately because there was no salvation to man, redemption to man. Then one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping, look. The lion of the tribe of Judah has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seal. And then further to that, there's rejoicing in heaven. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seal and open it. For you were slaughtered in your blood as ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nations. See, there's a big difference between this verse and what Islam is commanding. Islam is commanding to shed the blood of people. And this text here, it's not the blood of people that was shed. It's the blood of Jesus Christ only that was shed. He gave his life to ransom us, to redeem us. And your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe. And it is not exclusive to, to one thing. It is inclusive. Whatever status, whatever generation, whatever borders, there is no limit for the love of God. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son. He has not sent His Son to destroy, to kill. This is the enemy who is doing that. To judge and condemn, he has sent him to save and to bring and ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. This is the, the faith that we have. This is what looking at the end times is telling us. Every time you, you, you look ahead, you are brought back to Jesus. You are brought back to Jesus who rules, who reigns, who lives forever who all knees will bow before him. All mouths will confess that he is Lord. So when the Mahdi of the Muslim meets Jesus Christ, Jesus is not going to defer to him, but the whole world, wherever they are, people who exist, who are invented, but any human beings that have ever lived, great, rich, poor, from any nations will confess, will recognize the ones that was pierced for their sins. You know, a lot of people deny the major doctrines of Christianity, but our faith is based on it, and Jesus Christ and His resurrection gives us the proof, the evidence, and history. And look at the prophecy of the Old Testament that are being fulfilled. You know, the Islam religion has also an interpretation of Gog and Magog which is different from wh what we have. But one thing we must re realize, the, the prophecy itself came from Jeremiah 2,000 years more, 2,500 years before. Then Islam came and made another version of that. So which one should be the, the, the real one? The one who came after or the original one? The original one, it came from the Holy Spirit, it came from God, it's a vision into the future. Then come another groups who wants to conquer the world, they start as bandits. They, they, they go from country to country and they fight little tribes over little tribes, but they are very successful. And then it became a world religion, and then this world religion, then they, they have a version of Gog and Magog. Our version is proven, attested in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What Jesus has done is unique. The love of God is unique. The prize that Jesus has done is unique. The plan of redemption is unique. And the ultimate plan of God is going to be complete exactly as He will. And you and I, we are part of it. So we are not to live in this generation and see all these horrible uh, pictures of ISIS and be neutralized, live in fear and all of this, because we know what's happening in the future. ISIS will disappear, maybe Iran or another powerful will come, there will be coalitions of nations, war will continue until the time has come when God will settle his account with everybody and we are part of that. Amen? Amen. 
So, do you have a biblical eschatology? Do you know what is going to happen? How can you uh, contribute into this generation to lead many to God and to live a righteous life for the Lord Jesus?